Good morning, Mr. Hike. Are you able to hear me? Just before we get started, I just want to make sure we can test your Good morning, Mr. Hike. Are you able to hear me? Hey Mark, can I get a mic check from you? Hey Mark, can you hear me?
I will now call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment Back to Order. My name is uh, Rylan Johnson. I'm the MLA for Yellowknife North, and I will be uh, chairing today's meeting. Today we are receiving a technical briefing on the 2030 Energy Strategy with staff from the Department of Infrastructure and uh, staff from the Arctic Energy Alliance. I would like to remind all members and presenters that to direct all questions and comments to myself as chair and wait to be recognized before speaking to help us have a smooth meeting. Uh, and now I will ask all MLAs to introduce themselves as a bit of a mic check exercise as well for those joining us virtually in this hybrid meeting. Uh, but I'll start with the room on my right here. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Framelink. Thank you. Uh, and online, I believe, we have Emily Knockleby, Cleveland, Way Ellen Armstrong, and Bonnet Rouge. Uh, can I get anyone to introduce themselves? Hello, it's uh, Emily Knockleby. My apologies for not being there this morning. Thank you so much for coming today. Good morning, this is Caitlin Cleveland, MLA for Cam Lake. And I see that out oh, briefly, but uh, we'll work to make sure everyone online is connected and ready to go. But perhaps with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to staff in the room from the Department of Infrastructure to introduce themselves. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Robert Sexton. I am the Director of Energy for the Governor of Northwest Territories, as well as the President of the Board of Directors for the Arctic Energy Alliance. And my name is Benjamin Israel, and I'm, I am the Senior Coordinator of the Energy Division. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Haik, over to you. Morning, everybody. Uh, Mark Haik, Executive Director at the Arctic Energy Alliance. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I understand that you have a presentation ready for us, so I will turn it over to you. Perhaps we can bring the presentation up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to committee for inviting us here today. Uh, very excited to be here, actually. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, today, um, uh, I will be providing a presentation on, uh, that will include an overview of the 2030 energy strategy, uh, a slide that illustrates the scale of the issue, um, some figures that uh, illustrate the NWT emission, greenhouse gas emission trends, um, uh, a slide that shows um, energy strategy investments to date, um, some results for the uh, latest, uh, most recent action plan, um, what we're looking at in the new uh, three-year action plan, um, some discussion about energy economy modeling and 2050 pathways work for emissions reductions, um, um, some information about what the five-year review of the energy strategy might look like, and then some slides uh, about the Arctic Energy Alliance and, um, uh, and uh, the results of uh, various programs from last year. Next slide, please. Um, for everyone's information, uh, although this has been presented to committee before, we're, we're presenting it again as this is a public hearing. Uh, the 2030 Energy Strategy uh, is what sets um, um, is our guide to develop uh, affordable, secure, and sustainable energy for transportation, heat, electric, and electricity in the NWT. It was established, uh, released in 2018, and uh, after extensive public engagement. Um, so. What's important here is that it's not just about greenhouse gas emissions, but it's also about affordability and energy security. Um, and uh, it's, it's, um, the strategy itself uh, has sector-specific strategic objectives, including uh, working together uh, with communities uh, to find solutions, uh, to reduce emissions from electricity generation uh, by 25%, to reduce emissions from transportation by 10% per capita, Increase the share of renewable energy for space heating to 40%. Uh, increase energy efficiency 
by 15%, as well as a longer term vision to develop the NWT's energy potential and, and address energy uh, industry emissions. Next slide, please. So the scale of the issue. This is uh, what's called an energy flow diagram. Um, from left to right, it shows where our energy comes from, uh, the supply, all the way to the right, which shows the demand, where, it's, where it is used. So where it comes from to where it's used. Um, wh what I'd like to draw your attention to here is actually the left side. Uh, you can see that most of our current energy is imported in the form of fossil fuels, such as um, diesel and gasoline, that is the large black area uh, on the bottom left. <clears throat> this represents about 500 million litres uh, of fuel a year and 85% of the NWT's energy supply. So you can see there's a lot of work to be done to decrease our emissions, um, while at the same time trying to ensure energy security and stable energy costs. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Also, in terms of scale of the issue, uh, this is a figure that shows our greenhouse gas emission trends uh, over time by end use. Uh, you can see that there's generally a declining trend. Um, transportation is still one of our biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions. That's after heavy industry uh, buildings, uh, building heat, which is the dark green, electricity, and then waste. Uh, of note is that uh, heavy industry also contributes significantly to the transportation emissions as well. So a lot of those transportation emissions are associated with the industry. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And here's a, a figure that shows uh, NWT emissions trends and, and the current target. You can see that in 2020, most of the most recent data available uh, we were sitting at 19% below 2005 levels, um, uh, with our target being 30% um, below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, the green wedge uh, right in the middle uh, is, um, sorry, that's difficult to see, uh, but uh, it shows um, um, what the GNWT expects to directly achieve under existing funding and initiatives in terms of emissions reductions between 2020 and 2025. Uh, of note, uh, this is only what the GNWT is doing uh, and funding, and it doesn't include uh, what the federal government and indigenous organizations and governments are doing to advance greenhouse gas reduction initiatives. So it doesn't include, um, for instance, the federal policy landscape. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more later when we talk about the energy economy modeling. Um, uh, if you extend the trend line, it suggests that we can hit the target, but this of course assumes continued and additional efforts moving forward. Uh, we are currently doing modeling, as I said a minute ago, to understand the full impact of greenhouse gas reductions for what everyone is doing, including the federal government and indigenous uh, leadership. Um, so just a word of caution here, uh, you know, interpreting emission reductions trends is, is risky. Um, um, but um, as uh, a lot of things can happen in the next, uh, you know, eight years by the time we reach 2030, um, for instance, the trend line wouldn't capture large changes in, in sort of mining and industry going forward. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of uh, what we've invested to date in, in terms of energy strategy initiatives, since the release of the strategy in 2018, and up to March 31st, 2022, uh, we've invested a total of $137 million in, in various projects and initiatives. Um, uh, you, you can see that uh, we're ever increasing our investments as we, uh, as we learn uh, from our lessons in terms of what's most effective and how to best advance projects. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, results, um, uh, uh, here is a figure that shows uh, what we expect to achieve through the Energy Action Plan initiatives uh, up to 2025. Um, uh, projects funded right now, for example, uh, take time to deliver and construct and then show a full year of emissions. So uh, we've, we've extended out to 2025 the forecast on what current funding will result in. Um, you can see that there's 50.6 or 51 kilotons approximately 
2025, based on our estimates of just GWT actions, which will result in approximately 19 million liters of diesel fuel equivalent being saved per year. Uh, this means that by 2025, communities, businesses, uh, people will be saving almost $28 million a year in energy costs, assuming $1.50 a liter. Uh, this also means that through our actions and investments, we will save people, communities, and businesses over $104 million over eight years, plus an additional $28 million year over year after that. And that's what these emissions reductions mean to the NWT. Uh, this is an excellent result, um, I will just say that. Um, I'll also point out that um, that's just from emissions reductions. There are also investments in the energy strategy that relate to electricity infrastructure. So over the course of the energy strategy to 2030, there will be an additional $120 million uh, uh, funding provided uh, to address electricity infrastructure deficit. And that is funding uh, through the uh, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Uh, that is $120 million that people will not have to pay for in their electricity rates. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the, the new action plan, and my apologies, it is difficult to see. Uh, so for the new 2022-25 action plan, uh, we plan to invest up to $194 million over three years. Uh, many of these actions are continuations uh, from the previous action plan with existing uh, amounts of uh, funding. Uh, this is a breakdown of the investments by strategic objective. Uh, you can clearly see where the federal funding is concentrated under objectives 2 and objectives 4 or 5, uh, with the largest amount of money uh, being uh, invested through the action plan there. Please, next slide. And this is the action plan uh, funding by source. Uh, th we, we're showing this because um, it, it shows the sheer uh, magnitude of federal funding. And in fact, of that 194 million, 150 plus million of that is from federal sources. And what's, uh, what's, what's important about that is that that funding can only be used for particular things. For, in for instance, the investing in Canada infrastructure funding can only be used for uh, energy infrastructure. So larger scale projects. So in the next slide, I'm going to show an overview of uh, the key new initiatives and actions in the, in, the, in the new action plan by strategic initiative. And this is just an, uh, an overview of some of the, the more prominent actions. There are, there are many more available. I think there's 64 in total in the, in the new action plan. So under uh, strategic objective one, working together, uh, support community-led energy projects, uh, continue communications and outreach, uh, policy direction to the Public Utilities Board to address the community renewable self-generation caps of 20%, uh, continue with the greenhouse gas grant programs for governments until 2024 when the funding runs out, when the federal funding runs out, and then reinvest in the greenhouse gas grant programs uh, as uh, more federal money uh, becomes available. Um, on, on, that, on that note, uh, we, we have been told by the federal government, and this is public information, that, uh, that uh, there is um, recapitalized LCLF funding coming, and uh, there is uh, an allocation for the NWT. <coughs> We're still uh, working with the federal government now to, uh, to iron out the details on, on, on how that funding uh, is required to be used. Next slide, please. In terms of the strategic objective two, um, update the net metering policy and clarify support to IPPs. <coughs> That's something that we've heard over and over again, and uh, we, we intend to <coughs> place some clarity around these issues to help, uh, help people navigate and uh, do their part to reduce emissions and create their own energy security. Uh, there's, there's funding for more hydro asset overhauls, things like the Tolston, uh, existing Tolston, uh, hydro facility is due for a major overhaul, uh, as well as um, some of the snare facilities are, 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 are due for major overhauls. <coughs> this is a significant reliability issue, as if these, these plants um, uh, become unreliable, we're required to rely more and more on diesel fuel. Uh, we want to advance two community li liquefied natural gas projects, um, complete the Inuvik Wind project, initiate construction on the Fort Province T line, and advance the Wati transmission line. Next slide, please. 
In terms of transportation, this is uh, one of our most difficult uh, sectors to target. Um, uh, right now, our actions include uh, to undertake a trial of renewable diesel. Uh, if we can find a source of uh, renewable diesel that's, uh, that's suitable for use in the subarctic, uh, develop and launch a um, level two EV charging station rebate program that has been done, that was launched in earlier this fall. Continue to work with the federal government on emissions reductions targets in the transportation sector. Some of the best reductions in that sector will be related to efficiency and substitution within the heavy duty transport sector, and that's federal, uh, federal, federally led jurisdiction. Uh, support transportation issues for the Greenhouse Gas Grant Program. Uh, for instance, recently we uh, funded a uh, level three charging station in the Betchko area, uh, as well as uh, advance uh, the EV fast charging corridor from Yellowknife to the Alberta border as well as beyond that as opportunity arise. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, strategic objectives four and five, which is 40% um, renewable heat and 15% energy efficiency improvement, uh, we will continue and we have continued the core AEA as well as the GNWT capital asset retrofit program. Uh, we will continue the enhanced Arctic Energy Alliance programs and, and services until 2024, which is federally funded under the Low Carbon Economy Leadership Fund. Uh, we intend to review energy efficiency programs as part of the energy strategy review, uh, as we feel there's likely efficiencies that could be had in terms of uh, programming. Uh, we will continue the Greenhouse Gas Grant Program for industry and buildings until 2024. And then ultimately, we will look to replace the um, enhanced funding for AEA and the Greenhouse Gas Programs in 2025 under the new LCLF funding that will be forthcoming. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the long-term vision, um, one of the things that, uh, that, that we, we need to do here is uh, we have uh, many, many, many years, decades of hydro research and potential um, across the NWT. Uh, we, we need to take a better look at uh, uh, potential hydro sites cl close to communities and, and what it would cost uh, to, to advance these projects, uh, as well as build the transmission to connect uh, hydro to the community loads. Um, a lot of the studies that we have are, are older and the cost estimates uh, uh, need, need refining. Um, this is going to be increasingly important, uh, by the way, because uh, as, uh, as Canada moves towards electrification of end uses, uh, we are going to need uh, significantly more electricity generation capacity across the NWT. We, as part of our long-term strategy, we've placed the five-year review of the energy strategy. Uh, that's going to be critical because <coughs> the world has changed a great deal since we released the 2018 strategy. Um, we were doing work to develop 2030 and 2050 greenhouse gas reduction pathways um, to see what's feasible and what we can do here uh, to increase our level of effort if possible. Uh, we are going to advance the Tolston expansion project. Uh, we're going to undertake a techni technical and economic study to look at the feasibility of hydrogen implementation here. And uh, one of the big things, as I mentioned, is we need to assess the potential for electrification. Uh, what end uses can we electrify and at what cost? And the subsequent increase in electricity demand and infrastructure needs. So to give some sense of scope, uh, if the NWT were to uh, displace one third of its um, approximately one-third of its uh, heating load. Uh, with electrification, we'd have to double our electricity generation capacity. So uh, that's, uh, that's something we need to better understand what the implications of something like that are. And we do see it coming anyways with electric vehicles. That, that in itself is going to have a significant inc uh, impact on electricity demand. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, we're in the process of uh, energy economy modeling. So what that means is that um, uh, we need to better understand the energy emissions and the economy, where, the, where energy emissions and economy is going based on existing, as well as new potential combinations of policies, programs, and actions. So this is where I come back to 
uh, the figure I showed that with the emissions trend, we we can only currently account for what the GNWT is doing directly, but there's other things happening, and that includes the federal policy landscape, and federal funding across the north, and in order for us to better understand. Uh, where the emissions are actually going, we need to model this as part of energy economy modeling. So we've hired a firm called Navius Research, uh, which is the same firm that uh, all the other provinces and territories use to do this modeling. And they're going to provide us uh, increments every five years, all the way up to 2050, to look at what the energy economy and greenhouse gas pathways look like. And with that model, we'll be able to look at new policy and initiatives that uh, that. Uh, uh, to implement to change the trajectory of, of the emissions reductions. Um, <clears throat> it will also help us uh, understand the, uh, the potential uh, emissions reduction impacts of carbon tax, for example. Um, so we're still adapting the model uh, to fit the NWT context. Uh, as it turns out, uh, with 27 separate electricity grids, it's a bit of a difficult uh, <laughs> thing to do. So we are trying to get the model to represent our current energy system as, as, as closely as possible so that, uh, so that the results are more accurate. All right, next slide, please. Now this slide, I believe, has been presented to community before, but we're presenting it again because this is a public briefing. And we think it's a use, useful context. And it has to do with what net zero really means uh, and what it potentially means for us. If you look at this figure, uh, the first column uh, is today. It's our emissions uh, based on fossil fuels. Uh, if you look at tomorrow, there's two here. There's two two boroughs. There's one above the, the axis and one below. The one above represents um, uh, the light blue is uh, uh, emissions reductions that we achieve through things like renewable energy and alternative fuels. Uh, the, 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 the shaded section, turquoise section, blue section below that is the remaining greenhouse gas emissions reductions that we might still have left after we take care of all the renewals we can. And then the furthest column below the line is the net aspects. So it's the technologies we can use to remove carbon to get to net zero. So it's the removals plus what's remaining must equal zero. That's what net zero means. Um, so these are things uh, like um, carbon capture and storage. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what this means in terms of net zero pathways is uh, in, the, in the blue uh, column there, it's end use measures. So it's electrification, energy efficiency, conservation, fuel switching to things like biofuels and hydrogen. In the yellow column, it's zero emissions electricity. Uh, so that's firm renewables such as hydro, intermittent renewables such as solar and wind and batteries, and then potentially in the long term, depending on public um, public sentiment, uh, alternative energies such as nuclear and hydrogen. And then there's the net aspects, which are the carbon removals, which is the last column, which is carbon capture and storage. Uh, uh, for instance, at a, at a large power plant, you might choose to capture the carbon at the at the smokestack, or direct air capture, which are systems in which you just uh, not associated with a uh, coal plant, for example, you would just directly capture the carbon from the air and sequester it in some ways. And then, then, then there are things like um, nature-based solutions. So those are things like um, forestry pra practices and planting trees and and, th and uh, land-based solutions like protected areas and things like that. And then there's uh, the a third op fourth option, which involves uh, buying offsets which involves funding projects outside the NWT so we can claim the credit for the reduction. Uh, these are the types of elements that we have to consider when we talk about net zero pathway work. Next slide, please. So we're headed towards uh, 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 the five-year review of the energy strategy. Uh, it's due to commence next year, although we have started work on the modeling uh, to get the model in, in, in shape. Uh, initially, we actually only committed to reviewing the strategic objectives of the 2030 energy strategy, at least that's what it says in the strategy. Uh, we don't feel that it's likely enough anymore, uh, given how much the world has changed um, since the energy strategy was released. Um, so what's more likely is we'll take a, a more general review uh, approach to the strategy. And we're looking for new ideas on how to do this. Um, you know, is this the right approach? Are the targets right? 
do we commit to targets before we know if we can reach them or not? I mean, that's a legitimate question. What can we do better? How do we better support Indigenous leadership? How do we best leverage federal funding opportunities? Those types of things. Um, and, and there'll be a fairly uh, extensive uh, engagement, public engagement, seeking input from as many parties as we can. Um, in terms of the development, so right now we're, we're developing the process to do this uh, and, and framing the issues. And we're, we're starting the modeling, and uh, we'll use the modeling results to start a conversation about pathways and targets to 2030 and 2050. And all that will be publicly available. Uh, so the next slide, I'll start um, just a quick overview of the Arctic Energy Alliance programs and services uh, results from last year. So the Arctic Energy Alliance delivers programs and services to help Northerners conserve energy, become more energy efficient, and adopt alternative sources of energy. Uh, the AEA's programs are central to meeting the 2030 Energy Strategy's goals and objectives. Uh, from last year, uh, the Arctic Energy Alliance provided $1.8 million in rebates and incentives, which resulted in over one kiloton of greenhouse gas emissions, which is equivalent to converting one third of the power generation in the community of Tuktoyaktuk -tuk -tuk to renewable electricity. And, 1,800 megawatt hours of electricity savings, equivalent to taking three communities the size of Wrigley off the grid. Uh, significant results there. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, funding for Arctic Energy Alliance, uh, for last year, um, uh, the AEA invested over um, approximately $4.6 million uh, to provide energy programs and services across its um, six regional offices across the NWT. Uh, and this year's budget is approximately $6.5 million. Uh, next slide, please. In the new action plan, there is new funding for the Arctic Energy Alliance, and this is to meet uh, uh, public demand and what we heard about when we did our engagement on the action plan. Uh, so there's an additional $1 million uh, over the next two years uh, to support things like the EV rebate program, additional energy auditing capacity, community energy planning, and a program to address uh, energy poverty. Uh, you can see the list there of, uh, of what was uh, approved. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, again, apologies for the size. Um, but, but this is a regional representation of the results uh, from the AEA through its regional offices. Uh, but last year, in total, uh, the AEA provided 2,802 rebates or incentives. That's 100 more than the previous year. That included uh, 2,528 energy efficiency rebates, 124 home energy audits, 10 deep home energy retrofits, 52 community wood stoves installed, and including an additional 27 delivered to communities. 18 electric vehicle rebates and 65 alternative energy rebates. So that are that's things like biomass heating and uh, and alternative electricity generation such as solar. Uh, so this is spread out across all the regions of the NBT with about 950,000 of the 1.8 million in rebates going to communities outside of Yellowknife and the remaining 860,000 to Yellowknife. So next, I'll provide some slides on. Uh, some select AEA programs. Uh, in terms of the energy efficiency incentive program, of those 2,528 rebates, uh, 1,436 were LEDs. And uh, in total, uh, this program resulted in 550 tons of greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the alternative energy program, which is, like I said, biomass heating, pellet boilers, and solar solar panels, for example, 65 rebates were provided, resulting in 320 tons of greenhouse gas emission reductions, with um, five-year investment payback for 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 this funding. Uh, in terms of the deep energy deep home energy retrofit, we had 26 home evaluations with 10 final rebates given out worth $91,000. Um, that's a program where we uh, do do energy audits on homes and look for uh, the, the list of um, of best uh, efficiency measures, and then do a post audit to see how well the improvement was for the house. That might include insulation upgrades, uh, envelope upgrades, and things like that. Next slide, please. 
In terms of the uh, commercial energy conservation efficiency program, I think this is one of the ones that uh, showed uh, a little less uptake. Uh, this that year was uh, uh, the tail end of a COVID year, so um, there was a little less investment on the commercial side in terms of energy efficiency. But uh, in last year, we provided 30 rebates, uh, equivalent to 100,000 kilowatt hours of savings, which is the annual electricity used in Hanneyview for scale. And the payback on these investments were just uh, just around three years. So excellent, excellent investment value for commercial energy users. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the community wood stove program, uh, as I said a minute ago, 52 wood stoves installed in six partnering communities, resulting in 270 tons of greenhouse gas savings and $140,000 in annual cost savings for, for residents. And the last slide, please. Just uh, actually just a little bit of a shout out to the Arctic Energy Alliance for their 25 year anniversary. Uh, the EEA was established in 1997 and has grown and evolved over the years to meet public demands and needs, as well as to support the energy and climate change objectives of the GNWT. Uh, right now there's about 19, 20 employees in six regional offices and uh, we provide services uh, to every community uh, across the north to help uh, make their lives more efficient to encourage the use of alternative renewable energy for residents, businesses, and communities. Um, this is quite an interesting timeline, if, uh, which is available in the uh, last year's Energy Initials Report, which was released recently. Uh, and then the last slide is questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Sexton. Um, I'll open up the floor to any questions from committee. O'Reilly. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So maybe we could turn to slide six in the, the uh, package here. Uh, this is the one that shows mission trends and targets. And I'm having some difficulty reconciling this with uh, what was presented in the original 2030 energy strategy and then most recently in the energy initiatives report, I think it's called. Um, and then, because this is the first time I've seen this, and I would have thought that this was kind of front and center in some kind of integrated reporting from our government, but it never is. Because that's why we're, do one of the main reasons we're doing all of this stuff is to try to reach the Pan-Canadian Framework target, which is what GNWT signed on to. So, so in the, the 2030 energy strategy, was noted that we needed to reduce uh, our greenhouse gas emissions by 517 kilotons. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in the, the most recent energy initiatives report, it said that we had reduced, or it was predicted that we were going to reduce emissions by the end of 2023 by 47.3 kilotons. And I think that's probably as a result of the uh, this program or the the uh, stuff that you guys do in infrastructure alone um, what is the gap and uh, you know how does this you know because I, I think even in your presentation today the prediction is now up to 51 kilotons which is not what was in the energy initiatives report. So what is the gap and why is this not kind of like front and center presented in some sort of integrated, uh, you know, climate change report? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Emily O'Reilly. Mr. Sexton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, very good questions. Uh, and for the first question in terms of the energy strategy um, and how this relates to it, um, the, the figure in the energy strategy was produced in, in uh, you know, probably 2017 with the release of it in 2018. And, and the reality is the situation has changed a lot since then. Um, there has been continuous reduction in emissions as well as, uh, in fact, actually updates to um, national inventory data, which we rely on. Uh, this figure that is up on the screen is, is uh, our, our best 
information that we have. So as of 2020, we're at 1,400 kilotons. And to get to a 30% reduction, we need to get to 1,200 kilotons. So that means there's about a 200 kiloton gap right now to get us there. <clears throat> um, in terms of what's in the energy initiatives report, that 43 kilotons is what's going to be achieved. Sorry, was that by? I'm just sorry, I'll just reference the actual table. By 2020, so there's 47.3 kilotons in the energy initials report for 2025. Those, that's an estimate based on existing actions and initiatives that we have started. Um, with the new action plan, uh, we estimate we'll reach 51 kilotons, um, um, all combined by 2025. So if we reach the, the 51 kilotons by 2025, the gap will be about maybe 150, uh, 150 kilotons. There's a range there because the uh, 51 kilotons is a conservative estimate. So it's conceivable that some of our initiatives and projects will accelerate or we'll get them done faster than we thought. And also we know that we're getting increasing uptake on a lot of the, the programming. For instance, the greenhouse gas grant programs have uh, seen significant uptake this year, which means more anticipated reductions. This is all very tricky because this all depends on the state of the economy, uh, what we do, uh, what, the, what the climate patterns look like, uh, as well as what uh, other actors are doing, uh, such as uh, Indigenous leadership as well as the federal government. So it, I mean, it, it's clear to us that we need to do a better job of trying to explain this. Um, but it's also very much a moving target in any given year. And uh, we honestly do try to represent the data as at least as accurately as we can, if maybe not as clearly as it should be. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. Uh, any follow-up, Emily O'Reilly? Yeah, OK, thanks for that. Uh, I, look, I, I get this as a moving target, and it's complicated and so on. But you know, the fact that we've got three separate reports, one on carbon pricing or the carbon tax from Department of Finance, which anyways, uh, and then there's the energy initiatives report, and then there's the climate change strategic framework report from ENR. I don't know who's in charge of all this, but there should be one report. And this stuff needs to be front and center. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not trying to lecture anybody, and I probably not uh, probably have some uh, uh, receptive ears in the, the uh, here, but that's what I think people need to see and, and help focus on. Um, and, and of course, even those goalposts are moving now because the feds want everybody to go to net zero by 2050. So, and that's what I think. You know, you're doing the modeling around, which I, I think is great, a very good idea. But, you know, we, there has to be some focus on this 2030 target and explaining it better and where we're at. Um, quite frankly, we're probably going to meet it. And the only reason we're going to meet it is because DIVIC is going to close down. But that means there's no room for any anyone else to come in and do stuff. So, um, but we're not in a cap and trade system, but it certainly doesn't look good if the only reason we're going to meet the target is because DIVIC is going to shut down and then nobody else can really start production if, if any of the, the juniors ever get come online, but um, there's no room for anything else. But sorry, I'm just babbling now, but I just really want to push our government towards one report on climate change and get this stuff front and center. And, um, you know, I don't have any dis huge disagreement with the contents of what you're trying to do, maybe some of the emphasis, and we'll get to that in a further question. But we've got to have an integrated report that focuses on greenhouse gas emission reductions. But the side benefits of that, you know, creating jobs, uh, um, uh, in, in, and particularly in small communities around retrofits and stuff like that. And I think we need to talk about that as well in the integrated reporting a lot more, the economic benefits of this, these investments. So, sorry, I'm just babbling now, and that's enough for me. Thanks, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Emily Riley, for your comments. Uh, I didn't hear a question quite in there, uh, but uh, Mr. Sexton, any reply? No, oh, thank you. No, I, I, uh, I, I understand the frustration, and uh, we'll take that away, honestly. No, we know this is, this is an issue, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, I have Emily Bonnerer. Musty, Mr. Chair, and musty to the people appearing before us. Uh, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, my name is Ron Bonnetrus from the MLA for the Dead Show uh, and part of the Deputy Chair of the Committee. Um, so I'm not, uh, I, I think infrastructure is in the room. I'm not sure about Arctic Energy Alliance. I don't see anybody else in the room uh, from the camera angles, and I'm online. so. Uh, I know the Arctic Energy Alliance, they've done lots of uh, weather seals, combat uh, heat loss and whatnot, I guess. Uh, and that prevents well, your furnace from coming on uh, significantly, but it always does anyways. I'm wondering, um, because on slide 25, I see it, it you stating 65 systems. So I'm not sure if this is infrastructure or Arctic Energy Alliance that's uh, presenting this part here. But it's saying uh, you've got 65 systems, which is equal to 320 tons of greenhouse gases. I don't know if we saved uh, on there. Uh, and it's not clear what systems you're you're talking about on here. I'm, I, I'm just wondering if you could probably explain what kind of systems you're looking at there, and what what is that 320 tons representing? Uh, maybe I'll start with that. We'll see. Thank you, Emily Bonnetrich. Uh, so, Mr. Sexton is the director at infrastructure and also the president of Arctic Energy Alliance. So he's here wearing two hats, and we have Mark Hike, the executive director of Arctic Energy Alliance, on the Zoom call. So, who would like to take that question? I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Sexton, to start. Sure. I think uh, if I could direct that question to Mr. Hike of the Arctic Energy Alliance. Mr. Hike. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, MLA Bonnet Rouge. So, uh, the Alternative Energies Technologies Program funds renewable energy systems um, such as biomass heating systems, uh, solar PV, small scale wind, uh, things of that nature. Um, so, that's differentiated from our energy efficiency programs, which, um, as you alluded to, look at things like air sealing, insulation, windows, um, high efficiency heating systems, and that sort of thing. Um, so one of the one of the really positive developments we've seen in this particular program over the last couple of years uh, is a an increased emphasis on biomass heating systems. Um, so when we signed our contribution agreement under the Low Carbon Economy Fund in 2018 2019, uh, one of the requirements of that funding agreement was to um, not fund renewable uh electricity systems in hydro communities because if you're putting solar in a hydro community you're just displacing clean hydropower so there was there was more emphasis put on um, renewable electricity systems in thermal communities uh, which many of the communities in your region are um, but also uh, putting a focus on biomass systems so we have seen a considerable amount of, of demand for biomass systems um, in the past uh, year or two which has been been very positive those projects in particular have a, a really significant impact on greenhouse gas emissions because they are uh, displacing fossil fuel based heating systems with with renewable biomass heating systems um, there's certainly been a lot of interest in in the Daycho region on biomass in particular fort simpson has done a great job of kind of building up their biomass uh, infrastructure and and storage uh, which has been great to see and we're starting to see that spread to, to other communities throughout the northwest territories as well um, in addition last year we uh, we funded a project that uh, looked at a number of uh, cabin owners throughout the, the Daycho region, particularly in and around Fort Providence, um, to do solar PV so they converted off of diesel generators to, to move to solar PV. So right now I would say probably about 95% of the 
projects that are funded out of the Alternative Energy Technologies Program are either solar PV or biomass. Um, say three years ago and, and further back, that probably would have been about 90% solar PV and 10% other technologies. Um, but in this current fiscal year, we're now almost 50-50 between solar PV and biomass. So that's that's kind of where we're seeing the biggest impact in, in this program. And that's where the uh, the results that you're seeing here are being, being generated from. Thank you, Mr. Hike. Any follow-up, Emily Bonnevich? Merci, Mr. Chair, and merci for that, uh, Mark. Um, it seems like, uh, yeah, you're going through solar PV and biomass. Uh, you're talking about cabins. Uh, I think you had somebody else delivering that program for you. I'm not sure, because uh, the other one was a business um, in the community. Uh, so the 65 systems, I don't know how many of those are actually biomass and uh, how many of those are solar PV and whether there's any follow-ups, uh, you know, to ensure that they're even being working so that you're giving us, prop, you know, true, true facts when you're saying there's 320 tons displaced or something like that. Uh, but anyways... Um, that's probably going to be in the report somewhere, and we hope to see that at some point. Uh, I wonder if I could probably have a question for maybe the Department of Infrastructure. Because uh, we're really bad. Government is really bad at uh, any time of any type of uh, renewable energy. I think they got into biomass. Uh, I don't know. Uh, a while back, but it, it was long overdue. I think it was in 2014, I know a couple of MLAs went to Norway to look at their wood energy stuff. So that was a long time coming anyways there. So, and I'm not sure how come we're not, the department is not aggressively and actively trying the other sources of renewable energy whether it's uh, hydropower, you know, uh, uh, well, there's wind and there's solar, but not in a lot of communities, just here and there, but not aggressively in a lot of the communities to try them out. And also um, the biggest one is uh, the geothermal stuff, geothermal energy. It's always been known that uh, there's a lot of hot spots in the in Northwest Territories. There's lots around this area too, Fort Providence. Uh, that's which I'm currently at. Uh, and there's nothing in uh, in that area. There's no mention of it anywhere in your energy documents. Like, uh, and there hasn't been a smidge of uh, of looking at getting one developed to try it out. Where I was the last ones, you know, the GNWT, probably not of what Yukon will beat us to the punch, I guess. But uh, I'm wondering what, what's your take on uh, some of the energy yes. sources that I mentioned. Masi. Thank you, Ivanovich. Mr. Sexton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> so, to start with, uh, in terms of, um, I'll just address the, the government itself in terms of renewable energy. Uh, the, uh, uh, it is correct that uh, we've been focusing on uh, wood pellets for heating and it goes back to well before 2014. Um, uh, currently 33 percent of the, um, the heat load for government buildings is met through wood pellets in DBT. So we've seen significant success in that. Uh, in terms of options, um, right now there's solar in every community in the NVT to varying, varying extents. Um, uh, with uh, the, uh, the most important one being in Covo Lake, which has 100% installed capacity and a battery solution. So there are periods in that community in which uh, the generators are turned off during the summer, which is an excellent outcome. Uh, in, ter in terms of, uh, so, um, in terms of wind, uh, we are developing the Nuvik wind turbine, which will reduce um, um, uh, uh, diesel usage in that community by 3 million liters a year, which works out to something like $5.5 million 
in savings for the thermal communities per year based on $1.50 a liter. Uh, we're also working with the Aurora Research Institute out of Inuvik to uh, deploy uh, wind monitoring stations. Uh, they're called LIDAR units, but they're used to uh, assess wind uh, across. So we, we are looking. Uh, for wind, you have to have a, a viable resource. So we are looking across the territory on that. Um, In terms of hydro, we have years of historical data on hydro. We know that there's viable hydro sites close to several communities. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we, uh, we do have some funding now from, uh, from the federal government to do, to, to do a, um, to compile all of that hydro research and potentially uh, update cost estimates and, and, and look at that. So we will be doing that to have a better sense of hydro. Um, sorry, uh, the last point was, oh, geothermal, thank you. Uh, so we are working with um, uh, Fort Lear Development Corp. Uh, we have been for several years uh, on, on a potential uh, geothermal facility uh, in, in that area. Uh, Currently, uh, we we are we are studying the um, in cooperation with the NWT Geological Survey the um, the geology of the area. We know that there is um, a, re a resource. There's certainly heat, uh, but it's four kilometers down. What we don't know is um, uh, how permeable the rock is. We don't know how fractured it is. We don't know the quality of the resource. We don't know if it's acidic or salty. Um, and so right now uh, we have a, a research program in place where we're, we've collected field samples, at least the geological survey has, uh, to look at the permeability of the rock. And that study will be released uh, this spring, I believe. And from there we'll have to talk about what, what's, what the next steps are. Um, part of the issue with that is because it's four kilometers deep, uh, the only way to know whether or not there's a resource there is to drill a test well. <laughs> so you could be spending millions and millions and millions of dollars drilling test wells to find that you don't have a resource. So it's a pretty big risk for a community the size of Fort Lear. Uh, we know that there's, um, there's uh, potential across the Detcho uh, and uh, it's certainly something that we're actively looking at. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I've hit most of the points there. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. Uh, next on the list, I have Emily Knuckleby. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation and all the work that uh, Arctic Energy Alliance is doing to offset uh, greenhouse emissions. Because, as we all know from our recent conversations around the carbon tax, uh, you know there is a real drive from the federal government to get these these uh, these down and at a huge cost to, to people in the territory. My question, I guess, and, and I'm not sure how much the government can speak to this, or my apologies if you already did, I've been jumping in and off of the, the briefing or the, the press hearing today, but my question is around when we have uh, large additions to the, the energy producers in a region. So for example, uh, the additional solar panel funding that was announced up in Inuvik, um, it's my understanding that that will create uh, too much energy and cause the rates for the rest of the people in that region to have to increase in order to make up for the less demand on the uh, power corpse grid or the uh, and so I guess my question is what is the plan to deal with that um, as we try to transition over to to renewables we you know we have this aging infrastructure that is needs more and more propping up by the government uh, thank you thank you Mr. Sexton no, thank you uh, the, the, the good question. Um, so, uh, actually, at the top of our mind as well, <laughs> as we get increasing levels of intermittent renewables on grids, how do we manage that? So, uh, Inuvik is interesting. I mean, it is our largest thermal community. It's almost as big as all the other ones combined. So, it's actually a good place to be putting a larger scale uh, intermittent renewables. The so we have the Inuvik wind turbine, which is uh, pretty much big enough to meet peak load. Uh, there is a battery solution that's going uh, associated with that um, that 
a turbine. Uh, we have one megawatt solar uh, being advanced by NITAT Energy, uh, which uh, will be integrated into that grid, uh, taking advantage of that battery solution. The third one megawatt of solar that we heard about recently is still uh, in development stage, and we don't know a lot about that. There will be times in which uh, there will be no need for that additional energy, which means that it will have to be curtailed. So we just will have to not let it onto the grid. Um, the, the two solars are going to be, uh, certainly the first one is an independent power producer. So they're going to be under agreement with the Power Corp. And that agreement is set up in such a way that the rate that they get for their power feeding to the grid uh, should not affect electricity rates. So it's really the value of the displaced fossil fuels. So. It, 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 so that's uh, how we're trying to manage these types of situations where um, we want to give people a rate that, that uh, you know, is fair but also doesn't impact other rate payers. And in this case, uh, that, that's the, the approach, is that the, there's, the, there's more renewables than we need. Some of them will have to be curtailed. And the rates that people are getting shouldn't impact uh, rate stability. Uh, I mean, it should keep rates stable. It shouldn't increase rates. Yeah. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily Knockleby? Yeah, thank you for that uh, answer. And actually, that's a lot more encouraging than I was feeling before today uh, about what that was going to do to the to sort of the overall system. <clears throat> but there will come a point where we will hit that that cap, as you mentioned, where it won't be economical or it won't be sort of a, a replacement of the the cost. Um, I'm also concerned in a sense too because as we hit that point as well, we're dropping out. Um, jobs in the territory that have to do around fuel distribution, uh, et cetera, and we'll have less demand on our fuel, which will then maybe drive, I would assume, drive up costs of fuel, or it's probably a lot more of a complex uh, equation than that. So uh, I guess my follow up is how is, like, what is the approach the government is taking to ensure that when we hit that cap, we can continue to displace the the fossil fuels without having that cost borne by uh, the rate payers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. The, the question was more about, okay, well, I addressed the, 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 the displacement of jobs issue, and I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Uh, there will certainly be, and I think that it's well known across the world that there will be shifts in employment patterns due to a tra energy transition. And what that means in the NWT, I don't, I don't know. I, solar panels in particular don't require a lot of maintenance, uh, but we've never done the analysis to look. Uh, on the second point, um, one of the things that we've committed to do in the new action plan, and this is the point related to uh, electricity rates and, 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 and managing, you know, um, integrating more and more renewables, um, we, we, we are going to look at this uh, in the action plan. Uh, we, we, we did do three or four studies, four studies recently, uh, that gave us a lot of information about uh, what, what the impacts and benefits of, of, of sort of independent power producers and net metering and self-generation. And, and we will uh, likely be providing some instructions um, to the Public Utilities Board to uh, to help mitigate the rate impacts, while at the same time continuing to encourage, uh, you know, indigenous renewable energy projects, community renewable energy projects, and things like that. I, I think that may answer the question. If not, though, it's <laughs> thank you. Are there any further questions from committee members? I'm going to sneak one in, and perhaps you can answer this, Mr. Sexton, about what exactly that uh, direction regarding the uh, to the NTPC and the Public Utility Board will look like. Uh, I, I note the cap right now is 20%. I believe nine of the thermal communities have reached it, and quite a few have asked to go beyond that. Uh, do you have any more details of what the actual figure will be? Unfortunately, no, Mr. Um, that's ultimately a, a cabinet decision. So, uh, <laughs> in fact, I, I can't presuppose any decision on that. It may be right. Yeah. Right. We are all looking forward to seeing what that policy and direction looks like. Uh, next on the list, uh, back to Emily O'Reilly. Yeah. Um, no. Thanks for that. I was going to raise that as well, Mr. Chair, and I, I know Mr. Sexton will pass along to his cabinet colleagues that. Uh, probably would be a good idea to float that by this committee before it's finalized but um, yeah because when we 
we heard about this problem with the uh, cap uh, even last night uh, or yesterday when we heard from uh, Mr. Narasu from uh, Fort McPherson. But um, I wanted to ask a question about, uh, and this is not really critical of Arctic Energy Alliance in, in any way because I believe they have some great programs. But if I turn to slide 21, um, there's uh, quite a big difference between what was budgeted for the low carbon economy leadership fund, new project funding at $2 million versus what was actually spent, which was about $670,000. So what's going on there? And, you know, is it uh, the um, funding was received late in the year or people don't know about it or we don't people are not submitting projects that fit the criteria, the criteria are, are uh, too limiting or restricted. What's the story of this uh, funding and why it's not being spent? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. Perhaps, uh, Mr. Chair, I can uh, start with this question and, and then hand it over to perhaps Mr. Hike would have some input as well on the operational side. So this is, this is federal funding. Uh, we developed these these programs. It's 2018, 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, and um, so okay. So firstly, the new project funding are for things like um, uh, community energy planning um, implementation, and uh, there was also a um, program for uh, to. Uh, help uh, lower income homeowners and, and just new programming for the AEA to fill some gaps. So th there's two things and, and it's mostly related to constraints in the federal funding. So we don't have a lot of flexibility to move money around with that funding. So for instance with with the core funding, you know, if there's a undersubscribed program versus oversubscribed, we can shift money over to help meet demand. In this case, we don't have as much flexibility to do that in the federal funding. The other thing is that the federal funding um, uh, has ultimate recipient limits. And even though we were able to negotiate 75% contribution limits for, for instance, indigenous governments, for individuals, the cap is 25%. So in the NWT, 25%, uh, it turns out there's not enough to incent <laughs> application to uh, a lot of these programs. But perhaps I can actually turn it over to Mark to give a bit more detail. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Hick. Sure. Thanks for the question, MLA O'Reilly. Um, so there's a couple things at play here. Uh, initially, the low carbon economy leadership funding that uh, the GNWT and by extension Arctic Energy Alliance uh, started receiving in 2018, 2019 fiscal year, it was projected to be uh, about a three and a half year funding time frame uh, up to March 31st, 2022. Um, with the onset of the COVID pandemic, the federal government decided to extend that timeline out to March 31st, 2024. Um, so in one respect, uh, there was the original allocation of about $9.1 million in LCF funding that came to Arctic Energy Alliance, uh, which was, as I said, originally projected from 1819 until 2021, 2022 fiscal year. Um, and so we were permitted uh, to carry over funds from year to year. Um, and so in the 2021-2022 fiscal year, that was basically kind of the original uh, end time frame for that funding. So there were funds that were carried over from year to year and basically accumulated up to the point of landing in, in the last fiscal year. So that's one aspect of why there was quite a bit of funding available and perhaps not all of it uh, uh, was spent. Um, as Mr. Sexton alluded to, there was also constraints in terms of uh, the federal funding, both from um, kind of program by program allocations. So we don't have as much flexibility, and I, I wanna express right now that we really appreciate the flexibility that the GNWT and the Department of Infrastructure provide us with our core funding to move funding between programs based on 
uh, demand, uh, you know, under sub subscription versus over subscription. So that's been very helpful. Um, that flexibility doesn't exist in the same way uh, amongst the, the federal funding that we receive uh, on a program by program basis. So we've been tied into certain amounts uh, by program um, that is not as easy to to move those dollars around to meet demand in, in other places. Um, so that's that's a big aspect of it. Uh, and again, as Mr. Sexton alluded to, the the ultimate recipient caps that um, Environment and Climate Change Canada have put upon the LCF funding provides a big challenge. So for individuals and residents, no more than, or excuse me, individuals and businesses, no more than 25% uh, federal funding can go towards the total project cost, which creates a, you know, a barrier for a lot of uh, NWT residents and, and businesses. Uh, that number is 40% for NGOs and 75% for community and Indigenous governments. Um, but that's a bit of a constraint that makes it somewhat challenging to get kind of projects up and running. Um, having said that, we have seen pretty significant uptake uh, in, in most, if not all, of our programs over the last uh, three plus years. Um, but we're sort of at the point where that original funding allocation has a certain portion of it each year has been carried over to this last fiscal year that we're, we're looking at on this slide. Um, and now that we know that there is additional LCF funding coming, uh, we're much better positioned, I think, to look at our programs and our guidelines and how all of those programs are working and rebate levels and incentives and all those sorts of things um, because we have that bit of certainty to know that on a go forward basis, uh, we can design these programs to serve our clients better, which is ultimately our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow up, Emily O'Reilly? Uh, yeah, no, thanks for that. It, it sounds like um, there's probably some work that our government can do in collaboration with Yukon and Nunavut to make sure that the funding um, criteria that uh, is the way that the funding is given to us, that there's some greater flexibility for folks in the north and rural and remote areas to uh, uh, get the, the work done. But uh, I'll raise that with the minister at some point, but I know that our colleagues in the room are taking notes as well. But let's turn to the next slide, which I think is some really good news stories. Um, you know, I see that there's going to be some more work done to build energy auditing capacity, and that's a huge problem. We heard that last night uh, from Mr. Narasu. Uh, they, 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 they can't get audits done in, in Fort McPherson. Uh, there's the low income uh, program around energy poverty and uh, community energy planning support and e-bikes like wow this is great uh, I don't know how big <laughs> the incentive is going to be but um, I'm I'm sorry that Mr. Simpson isn't here because he, he actually made a member statement about this and uh, I've been urging uh, Ecology North to partner with uh, maybe um, uh, Overlander here in Yellowknife and get some e-bikes for uh, members to ride around the the uh, loop here in front of the assembly in the summertime, but uh, sorry, my question is because I think there's some good news stories here. Uh, what is the, in particular, the, the this uh, low-income program to address energy poverty? Because I know, uh, Mark, you and I have talked about this for quite a while, years probably. So, what is this program going to look like, and what is it going to be able to deliver? Uh, I'm, maybe I'm jumping the gun, but I, I think this is really good news. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. Thank you, yeah. thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, it's not fully defined yet, is the answer. H however, I think the immediate need uh, will be to use that money to help um, bolster the LCLF money that's aimed at lower income homeowners. That way we'll be able to spend more of the federal money, uh, offer more than a 25% rebate so that we can have uh, more uptake there and actually help, because we know if you're a low-income homeowner, you don't you don't have any money, let alone 75% of the cost. So I think that's the immediate the immediate uh, target for that money. Um, first time we've ever offered something like this, so it will evolve as we better understand the need. Thank you. Thank you. Can someone tell me what the individual rebate is going to look like for the electric bikes and on the land vehicles? Is this next <laughs> bike? I don't know, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think we'll have to do some research to find out what other jurisdictions are doing to make it fair. This is what we did with the electric vehicle rebate as well. 
Thank you. And uh, I think probably also on that policy work, I, I think most jurisdictions require it to be purchased from a local supplier. So that may be a conversation to be had. Uh, any other questions, comments? Emily O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm you know, furiously trying to scroll through the actual um, action plan itself, but my recollection of this is that uh, um, you know the, the biggest ticket item in the whole, in terms of costing out all of these initiatives, is still money being spent, pardon me, wasted on Tolson expansion. Uh, <laughs> Look, uh, um, I agree with much of what you guys have been asked to do. I just think that we've got to find a way. I could probably live with expanding Tolson to have a, a line come to Yellowknife or something, but to continue to rely on a, on expansion to sell uh, power to imaginary mines when one or two of the diamond mines are probably even going to be closed by the time uh, it could even be built. We've got to stop fooling people. And sorry, this is, I should be addressing these comments to the minister, not to the colleagues in the room. Um, but to go to Ottawa and the top item in terms of asks when the cabinet members go to Ottawa is Tolson expansion when we need money for housing and lots of other good things that are in here. This is ridiculous. So, sorry, that's a comment, and I do not expect an answer, and I'm not going to put my uh, colleagues here on, on the uh, hot seat about this, but I just, you know, when the, the, the biggest ticket item in, the, the, in terms of expenses in the, the uh, Energy Action Plan is Tolson expansion, where this is still not heading in the right direction, and that's a political matter, not for our colleagues to address. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I may actually frame a question in there in that the <laughs> the 2030 energy strategy, the amount of displacement attributed to Tulston, I, I think we all agree is a no longer a realistic number. It's a number that imagines a transmission line to the diamond mines and that's the carbon we're offsetting. Uh, I don't even think that's in phase one or two business plans or at presently that we're going to get that transmission line built to the diamond mines. So I, I, I guess in terms of a technical question, Mr. Sexton, I, I would welcome when we will kind of see, you know, firm what the reduction would be for Tolston. Thank you. Uh, so no, thank you, because um, um, just I'm not sure how much of that I can address. Um, but what I can say is it looks increasingly like we're going to need a lot more electricity generation in some form to meet electrification demands. And that's one of the things we're looking at right now. And where that comes from, I, you know, it's not my, uh, I don't set those priorities, but uh, I do know that uh, uh, electrification in terms of vehicles as well as uh, other end uses is going to uh, require significantly more generation in the long run. So. Thank you. Uh, and probably just a comment that I think probably some conversation about what is going on with snare uh, is probably warranted. I mean, the system's over 75 years old and NTPC is just as concerned about, you know, its viability and the replacement cost on that would be billions as well. So we... Yeah, the, the, uh, strategy, uh, what, what was the number I quoted? $120 million going towards those types of retrofits. So we've already um, funded um, Snare G1 overhaul, which was on the order of $20 million. We had a certain percentage of that was federal money. Uh, we are we will be funding the to existing Tolston overhaul. There's also, uh, 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 as you say, it's likely that NTPC is best suited to talk to this, but there's also uh, additional money to uh, up update uh, other aspects of snare that need to be updated because, as I said earlier, without reliable hydro, that means we're, at least in the near term, relying on diesel generation. And it's not cheap or desirable if you can keep your hydro assets running reliably. Great. Uh, any further questions, comments from committee? 
Hearing none, thank you very much. Oh, go ahead, whoever that is. Oh, go ahead, Emily Whalen Armstrong. Yes, um, thank you for the presentation on, um, and this energy profile, which I call and um, for four of my communities or the communities that I represent is very informative. I just want to know if um, this energy profile that um, was given to us um, about a month ago. Uh, I'm just wondering, are those, um, are you providing that to um, other people as well, like the constituents or the people in general? Because it is a lot of good information on there about the energy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Saxon. I still have another one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe that's a question for Mr. Hike. Mr. Hike? Thanks. Sorry, my con connection cut out there for a second. You hear me okay? Yep, here you know. Okay, perfect. Thanks for the question, Emily Whelan. Uh, yes, we, uh, we do those uh, community energy profiles periodically for uh, 32 out of the 33 communities in the Northwest Territories. So um, the ones that you found that, uh, that we provided to MLAs about a month ago, uh, the baseline year for that data was 2018. And um, typically it'll take about a year to 18 months to, to produce those. Um, they are available for all of those 32 communities on our website at aea.nt.ca. Uh, right at the top of our homepage, there's a little communities button. Um, and if you mouse over that, it'll show all communities in the Northwest Territories. You can go to any community uh, in the NWT and uh, find that community energy profile for that community. Um, so I, I'm very appreciative to the work that our staff do in pulling all that data together. It's quite an undertaking. Um, but as you mentioned, it's a very useful tool for community members, community governments to understand the sources of energy in their community, uh, what kind of greenhouse gases they're producing, as well as the, the cost uh, of energy for each, each member of those communities. So uh, those are publicly available and uh, we would, we would uh, be happy to uh, share those more widely or promote them with, uh, with community members. And um, I guess we'd encourage MLAs to do the same for their constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily, Way Ellen Armstrong? Yes, yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for the information. Um, I, I know that we're um, trying to reduce the green uh, greenhouse gas. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry here. I know we're trying to, um, to reduce um, the, um, the heating and the hydroelectric, all that. And then I understand what you said about um, going with a, um, to say for, uh, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I, this is um, aside from that, but I just want to ask, and I know that I did ask um, before, uh, I, I just want to ask if there was any study done regarding installing a power line on Highway 3 from Yellowknife to Wati or, you know, Parkway to Fort Providence. I just, it's, it's probably off topic, but I just wanted to know if there was any study done in that area because I know that because you can see a lot of, um, a lot of these cabin on the highway, they're using uh, diesel, uh, not diesel, uh, they're using generator. And so what can we do to help these uh, people living on the highway, owning a cabin, and a lot of them are using it for healing as well. You know, like I, I know there's some healing camp on the highway three. So what can we do to help these people um, in, to get away from, because I know it's gonna cost loss to even install a, an electricity um, or to install a power pulse. So what can the, um, the Arctic Alliance Energy or what can we do to help these people? Thank you. Perhaps I'll ask you start, Mr. Saxon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, when we look at transmission lines, uh, we look at the distance that you have to build it because every kilometer costs a certain amount of money. But also the size of the population you're serving 
because the stuff has to be paid for through electricity rates for the most part unless we can find federal subsidy but still it has to be maintained and whatnot so so when the uh, the Wati transmission line um, and we're working with the federal government quite closely on this uh, the, the the most direct route is um, almost east west directly from snare along the current winter road alignment to Wati um, by far the cheapest route um, in terms of the uh, the residents and the cabin owners uh, along that highway uh, it, it, those types of things might be a better fit for off-grid renewables and, and perhaps I could uh, actually have uh, Mr. Hype talk about what programs are, would be available through the AEA for that type of uh, initiative. Mr. Chair. Mr. Hike. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Emily. Uh, Wayland. We do have a number of programs. So Arctic Energy Alliance doesn't really focus on uh, power infrastructure per se. That's that's more the purview of infrastructure and NTPC. Um, however, as Mr. Sexton mentioned, we do have a number of funding and uh, incentive programs um, that can focus both on the energy efficiency side, but also on the, the renewable side. Uh, as an organization, we always encourage uh, energy efficiency as the the first step in terms of of improving um, you know lowering costs and and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we do have some uh, programs that will provide rebates on things like energy star appliances, uh, wood stoves, pellet stoves, LED lighting, programmable thermostats, things of that nature. Um, and then we also have funding programs that will provide uh, funding for renewable uh, energy systems such as solar PV. Um, under the low carbon economy funding arrangement that we've been in since 2018, 2019, we've expanded the eligible uh, expenses as part of a project. So uh, things like freight, um, uh, battery storage, things like that are now eligible to be considered in the, the rebate calculation. Um, so if you have constituents that are, are along Highway 3 and are, are interested in reducing their, their dependence on diesel generation and would like to explore some options, um, beyond the, the funding that we provide for, for projects, uh, we also have technical staff who can provide advice. So if anybody is um, interested in learning more, not only about our programs, but about potential solutions to, to reduce their dependence on diesel generation, uh, we're always happy to talk to those folks. So uh, please uh, encourage them to get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments from committee? And on behalf of committee, I would like to thank our presenters here today. Uh, and with that, we will end our public broadcast. Members, I'm going to propose we take